Uh, we just had our data point drop for the PMIs. Let's see what we've got here. So we had the ISM, uh, let's see which one, was, ISM manufacturing PMI for June came in uh, at 48.5 compared to consensus of 49.1. That is a lower than anticipated number. Same thing with prices paid, PMI, new orders index was slightly hotter. Employment index was slightly lower. So it seems like a bit of a, uh, let's see, go down to our five minute chart, a little bit of a bearish reaction from the dollar. Told ya. I don't. Um, not as good. Um, well, it's not good for businesses, but it's good that it's below 50 and that we are also again showing signs of, of weakness and 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 that, that the economy is deteriorating. This is this is promising for your uh, rate cut in July. Yep, yep. That's that's certainly a, a one step in the right direction. And you know, for those of you guys who are. Um, kind of newer to this stuff, one thing to think about here is that if you do get a cut in July, it would be a big surprise to markets. It would cause gold to surge higher. It would cause a lot of um, kind of more sensitive areas of the stock market to surge higher. The Russell would surge higher. The uh, technology sectors would certainly surge higher. Um, so we'll see. But again, it's a little, you know, we have so much data this week. Manufacturing is a smaller component to the U.S. economy than services. So services on Wednesday will be very important as well. But uh, we'll just have to see. Uh, interesting week we have here with holidays, but yet we still pack in some some information. Um, Jerome Powell speaks this week. We have uh, ADP non-farm. We also have FOMC minutes. And then we have non-farm payroll right around yep. the old holiday on Thursday. Yes, it is going to be a hectic week, to say the least. I mean... Starting off with a bang, we had uh, PMI data come in software. I don't know, you might have been listening to a little bit of that conversation, Chris. We were just talking with Ivan about the idea of, is there a possibility that July meeting could swing into becoming a live meeting? I think right now there's like a 10% chance that we see a rate cut in July. It's not very high, but you also have to understand it's a 10% chance before we get the data for July. So we could, between now and then, see ginormous swings and hence volatility in the markets between now and the time of that July meeting to when they actually make a decision whether or not they're going to cut or hold interest rates. I mean, is it possible, Chris? This is my other conspiracy. Frank and I keep talking about this. Is okay. it possible that people are people, human beings are human beings, they wanna keep their job and the presidential debate seems to have gone really well for Trump and he's made mention that he would do some changes to what the Fed's got going on if he were to take presidency. Is there some conspiracy work here where Fed officials may want to keep their job? Maybe uh, if data comes in soft, they'll be more willing to cut interest rates sooner. Is that possible? I don't think it's going to matter if, if, if Trump wins. I don't think anybody in the Fed's going to going to feel comfortable. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, we're talking about well, what I'm saying. What I'm saying, Chris, is that if there's a possibility to assist the incumbent, you know, candidate, uh, Biden, but by will be a Biden? rate cuts. That's, I mean, are you seeing that right now? It's like, and, and I, I don't am. Wanna, yeah, yeah. I mean, the fact that the Democrats are maybe trying to scramble to find a new candidate, it's like, who knows how that's going to be received? Um, I mean, I'm fine with it. I could care less. I, I'd rather vote for four four years of a shadow. You know, it's like take zero, zero presidents right now. It's like, this is a joke. I hate the fact we're even talking about this and it's going to be now front and center until November. Um, well, but yeah, exactly. to get to get the conspiracy, I mean, I I do think that the the Fed cut that is the most probable right now, September is really what the market expects. Uh, the market's done a really nice job of not panicking expecting you know five six seven cuts and ripping the way that it did from q4 to q1 and now the market's backpedaled into maybe thinking one cut maybe one or two cuts by the end of the year um if the fed cuts in september i really think that is just a sigh of relief for the consumer a sigh of relief for small business a sigh of the week for or sigh of relief for the housing market uh i i, I mean to consume some interesting content this week the consumer in the u.s is not buying goods but they're buying travel and I've seen that leisure. And, 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 and so, I mean, it's, it's hotels, it's cruise lines, 
Carnival, um, yeah, I've, I've seen that in the right? earnings stuff too. Yeah, yeah. so that, that's been where most of the money is going as far as is buying. Also, most of the consumers, surprisingly, like our real estate market is keeping the U.S. consumer pretty flush, pretty liquid, um, which isn't a great thing because, I mean, if you're sitting on equity in your home, the only way you have access to that is by borrowing against it. Um, but when a lot of people have seen over the last five years, housing prices increase, you know, 50 percent, sometimes 100 percent in certain areas in certain cities, that's a lot of cash to tap into that. Hopefully, if you're borrowing on that, you're borrowing at a affordable rate or you're leveraging that in some capacity. Um, but it was interesting, like a lot of people, it's like 96 percent, 97 percent of, of uh, mortgages in the U.S. are fixed rates and not variable. Right. So the idea of, you know, we don't have this crazy thing like in Canada where every five years they they're uh, reassessing variable rates and, and so you go to the market. So, I mean, anyway. The Fed cutting, I don't know, man. I mean, I hear the arguments both ways. I, I, I also hear that the Fed should cut. I, I hear that if the Fed cuts, it's going to flare up inflation again. These markets got to rip. You got, I mean, just you, you said earlier with Ivan, if, if small caps rip and, and gold rips and all these things are going higher, the Fed can't contain that type of asset appreciation, which also puts us into a bit of a bubble. Um, yep. I don't know. So, I mean, it, it's... It's not going to be easy, and, and this is the same conversation we've had many times. Very few times in history has the Fed gotten it all right. And if they decide to cut and the market doesn't react the right way or the market reacts, you know, crazy, bullish and bubbly, or the market tanks, that's the Fed breaking something or the Fed doing something stupid when they should just stay out of the way. Uh, but with this year's election, the Fed may be a little bit more political in that sense where, sure, if they cut, maybe it's good for the market. But I think the Democrats right now have a lot of problems where they're trying to figure out, you know, who to vet, who to get in there for a potential candidate. And like I said, man, I don't even care. It's like, I, I go back to a South Park reference. It's, you know, <laughs> it's a turd sandwich or something else. I mean, you, you can fill in the blanks, but you've seen the episode <laughs> I'm talking about, but you don't have good choices and it just sucks to be thinking like yeah. that's what we can do as a country with a, 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 a stupid two party system that gives you nobody um, and certainly in this case, it's not any better. So like I said, I don't vote, I don't, um, I don't trade politics, uh, but certainly you trade policy because it has a big influence on what the market does for the next four years. And speaking of policy, I think that, uh, you know, the market definitely kind of, so this is TAN, this is the solar ETF, um, that I talk about periodically, obviously, uh, helped by a lot of the tax incentives and the, um, kind of uh, the Biden administration, you're making kind of a push for this stuff, uh, or the at least the expectation that they mm -hmm. will do so or continue to do so. So um, TAN traded much lower here, right around when the the um, the debates uh, happened last week. Yeah. So um, yeah. I think that that's kind of interesting, because that is kind of a tell of what the market is feeling, at least for now, about how the debates went. And uh, as you mentioned, we'll see what happens with with the Democrats, whether they uh, change out who their who their you know candidate is or whatnot. But in terms of uh, financial markets, I think that you know you're looking at a lot of potential inflation. I would ag agree. You know, either ways, they both spend a ton of money uh, in their in their respective administrations. Neither of them is exempt from that, and uh, yeah. it, either one will again probably continue to do so. So, yeah. um, you know, I think that what that does is it is it kind of keeps me uh, cautious as to to what I want to do with with stocks, what I want to do with with uh, markets. And, and I kind of continue to like my idea with gold and silver of just that potential kind of uh, commodities hedge this year just because of their lower correlation directly to the stock market. Um, I do think that continued spending could keep continuing the the uh, the stock run for some time. I'm, I'm, you know, willing to stay long uh, tech if I can keep it, and um, you know, other areas. The Russell is an interesting one for me. I think it's the it's going to be at some point the trade of the, you know, 
the trade of the decade maybe is you know small caps being so so blatantly um underperforming for yeah. for some time now for several years really and uh you know i think that will change at some point but you're probably going to need to see continued spending you're going to need to see um inflation kind of normalize a little bit and growth kind of reaccelerate uh for for the russell to finally get uh, get up and running. So we'll see. What are your What are your thoughts on the Russell right now? Yeah, I mean, it's it's the best index catch up trade we can have right now. I mean, I, I look at all of these. Uh, you know, the the spy and the cues. I think need to have a pullback. Um, you know, this week with with kind of an odd week with a holiday right in between. Um, you know, I mean, th this is last week's price action, right? I mean, Friday was a crazy day to finish out the month and finish out the quarter. Um, you know, I was long the spy to a 548 call, had some extra profit. I turned a 65 cent, 64 cent debit into like two bucks. Uh, that was all on Friday's movement. And then we tanked on Thursday or on Friday as well. I think Frank had a long put at 550, which uh, paid pretty well for the day, but I think he's holding it to today. Hopefully it goes a little bit lower for him. Uh, but this is, this is what I'm looking at. If we break, if we break last week's low, okay, and we take out, you know, not just last week, but the week before, then our CPI gap comes into play, uh, which puts us down into like the 537 area. Um, and then, you know, I, I'd say we're a little bit more vulnerable to the downside just to have a correction. You know, we're talking, you know, 2%, not, not in a single day. I mean, that's been the one thing, what we're 350 days or something without a 2% day. Uh, but we could have a 2% pullback. We had a, you know, six, 7% sell off in April. So let's see if we can get like a three, four, 5% correction. Um, but maybe we don't. I mean, we have two weeks of indecision, but the, the spy, you know, overstretched with divergence, the Qs overstretched with divergence, the Dow, um, I like the Dow for this. I mean, they, they kind of look a little bit toppy, Nick, you know, but I see a potential uh, ascending wedge where we have this push up here, maybe some consolidation on the Dow. It does look a little toppy where if it starts to break and get vulnerable, yeah, it's not, it doesn't look great, but ascending wedges usually are, are facing this. They deal with some indecision, get rid of my squiggles here. Uh, and once we had this market pushing up with equal highs, equal highs, equal highs, equal highs, this is the blow off you're talking about. You know, the Dow might be okay. Uh, we might, if we see some heavier sector rotation, the Dow probably benefits from that, even though it's uh, it's price weighted, which is, I think at some stage is helpful, even though it has the results on might as well be on the SPY. But the Russell, I keep going back to the Russell. I just want to see this trade work, man. I mean, if you go IWX, that's Russell growth. If you go, uh, or the top 200 rather, what what is the, uh, what's the small cap growth? It's um, IW, um, IWF. IWF for growth and IWX for the top 200. Um, your Russell, I'm long the Russell. I'm wrong, I'm long Russell futures. I'm long the IWM, uh, but it's, it's with options. So I'm essentially just collecting income. But this trade to get to the all time highs is 21%. I think my favorite thing about this is you can measure it. So are we gonna have a 20% blow off in the SPY and the Qs? Maybe, but to see this as a catch-up trade, if we have a rip like we had in late 2023, the Russell can outperform everything for that, you know, quick rotation. There's lots of, there's lots of opportunity right here. I just think it needs to be confirmed. So, I mean, how much longer does this go? Maybe through the end of the summer, maybe if, if you're right, maybe we come into the summer and the Fed cuts in September, Maybe this is what gets the market going and we just have September, Q4, doesn't matter, blow the top off, let this thing rip. Um, both both parties, like you said, whoever comes into the presidency, whether it's uh, switching up the entire checks and balances with a new administration, they're both gonna spend money. I don't think anybody yeah. thinks that like Republicans come in and we're going to austerity. There's no freaking way. This is gonna be about decreasing the dollar. This is gonna be about, you know, influencing the markets and decreasing you know, taxes and it's it's i mean if it's economic focus it's going to be everything it's going to be the kitchen sink it's like people are swinging more far more to the right more to the left and i think the government's doing the same thing with fiscal policy they're swinging more and just spend just spend and print just just appreciate just debase um so you know i like hedges gold is good silver is good two of my favorite trades right now and um i want to remain long equities i think the indexes are pretty straightforward i think the market's going to continue to ignore a lot of things this year but it just feels like we're rattling off all these things and it's like, yeah, the market can go higher or the market can tank. Um, but at the yep. same time, we have to be ready for, there's also an in-between, Nick. The market doesn't do anything. There's an in-between, yep. the market just kind of slowly, steadily hums along. 
and everyone wants these blowout tops or everyone wants this crash. But the reality is what happens the market just kind of steadily does what it does, which is it tries well, to- And that's the thing is, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people are, are so used to last couple of years, which have been a very trendy couple of years. Four years, man. You know? we've, we've, we haven't had sideways in four years. Yeah, it's been just trendy one way or the other. And then, you know, if you go back in, in history, there are periods like 2015, which were just, you know, well, let's let's take this as kind of a, let's stretch this out. You could have said basically from like August of 2014 until, you know, February, March. I mean, really all the way until here, you had this range on, um, you know, the, the NASDAQ for for several, for several, several, several months. So, and then, um, you know, there's also periods, let's see if we can just go back further. Um, you know, 2000, the 2000s were one ginormous range, which was sure. uh, an incredible, incredible, you know, that, that was another thing too, between I think 2000 and 2012, value outperformed growth. And that's a long time for value to outperform growth. A lot of people, uh, again, in this bull market phase, they believe that growth just simply outperforms value. And while it may over very long stretches, there's also long stretches where value can really outperform, especially if we enter into uh, a bit more of a, of a growth slowdown. If that does occur, you know, you may, you very well may see the Dow Jones do well. Now, again, that growth slowdown would not be good for the Russell, uh, but we may also just see, like you're saying, a phase where we just, kind of go sideways where we don't see a massive, you know, shift in the economy. Maybe the economy just kind of hangs in there. It's not super impressive. It's not super terrible. Maybe that's the catalyst to a sideways market, Chris. People just speculating both ways. Oh, it's gonna sure. slow down or oh yeah. it's gonna it's gonna heat up again. Maybe it just kind of hums that's and it doesn't either. like Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me let me throw some numbers out at you. I thought this was really interesting this this weekend just listen to some good content. Uh, the tale of two markets. Just in 2024, some of these gaps and some of these spreads and some of these differences between you know this index or this instrument versus this instrument. So U.S. large cap, just take the SPY versus U.S. small cap. Okay, you can take the Russell, you can take the I, the IJR. Small cap versus large cap. Large caps around 15%. Small cap negative two. About a 17% spread in difference in performance. That's a big difference. Okay, U.S. growth versus U.S. value about a 15% difference. Growth obviously yeah. outperformed value. Um, the US versus international, about a 10% spread. US is up 15%, international is up about 5%. Uh, we haven't seen higher highs in Europe. We haven't seen higher highs in Japan. We haven't seen higher highs uh, really anywhere in the world outside of the US, right? We saw higher highs into March and April, but those major indexes, if you look at the DAX, the FTSE, the DK, they have not made higher highs since, uh, since March or May. Um, but the U.S. is outperforming by about 10%. You look at this all the time, SMH, semiconductors up 48% for the year. Take one of the crappiest sectors in the U.S., that'd be regional banks down seven, almost 8%, 55% spread. So that's your, again, your tech versus, uh, you know, value, if you will, or just finance. Uh, short sure. versus long duration in bonds, okay? Short duration is up 2.6, long duration down 8%. That's a big spread in difference in bonds. We only have about a 0.3% inversion right now but somebody asked me this morning, you know, what about the TLT? What about the 20 year? If you look at the 20 year, the, 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 the yield's not cracking. You know, our, our, if we go to the US 20 year, oops, uh, US 20 year. Yeah. I'm listening, Chris. I just got to shut my window one sec. Oh, you're good. Uh, so the 20 year bond yield is right here at 4.73. I mean, it'd be nice to think like, oh, if I just, you know, parked money for the next 20 years, didn't have to touch it, collect 4.73% a year, risk-free, it's pretty good, right? But the issue is, I mean, we're still in this 300, uh, 350, almost 400 day inversion. Uh, we're getting that two year window, which is gonna be really interesting. It, I mean, October, 2024 is gonna be two years since we inverted. Uh, that, I mean, that's gotta matter. It's like the three month and the 10 year have typically always been right when it comes to some type of recession indicator. Same thing with the two year and the 10 year. Um, we can actually look and see that spread. And then dollar versus yen is another one like crazy tale of two markets where uh, I talked about this this morning, Nick. Uh, this is one thing. I don't know if you're if, if you and followers are trading the yen. Um, but what's interesting is the Japanese yen and, and the Bank of Japan don't necessarily intervene when it comes to a certain price. But what they do is they tend to intervene when it comes to rate of change. 
And so when we had this intervention right here, this, this October, November of 2022, that was a depreciation on the yen. Uh, we started intervening here. It was, a, it was a, about a 10 to 11% move. And we end up stretching around 16% before they really start to put, put that um, you know pressure on with, with repricing the yen. Um, we're looking at the same type of window. I just said ballpark wise, if we take this recent run from the, let's say the, the last intervention, we take the same low. So you go to this spot right here on the end, right here. If we go up another, let's say nine to 11% where the Japanese end gets weaker, that might be another level of intervention. And I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm ballparking this, but I'm saying 165 to 170. So I am not calling the top at 160. I said to traders, if we hit 160, doesn't mean I wanna be short. If there's no confirmation to, to sell it, don't sell it. This just stays in, in drift mode. But 165 to 170, Again, it, it is so difficult to trade as a currency trader. You can't just anticipate and, and get you know rewarded by the Bank of Japan. Maybe you can, but that's probably not going to come with uh, you know I pick the perfect stop loss for a Japanese intervention. That's probably not gonna sure. Happen, you know, yeah, very very difficult to do for sure. sure. And you've got uh, you've got dollar yen as you mentioned. The the chart just looks just like it's just going to want to keep trending for now. But we'll see yep. where that goes. And as you mentioned, the rate of change concept is is interesting it would make sense that they would kind of want to jump in when it's when it's pushing aggressively to try yeah. and jump in front of something that's that's happening and so it, and let's think about the timing right let's say that this just drifts 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 and it's maybe not crazy running but being look at every day if the if the yen goes up 50 points you know and then we pull back and we go up another 50 points we pull back it's like if we for the next two three months before the fed starts to cut in september uh before you know if the fed cuts but i think they they probably will um I, I still keep going back to something's going to break. In my opinion, the Fed's not going to get away with like this type of extreme policy that we've seen the last couple of years. Something's going to break. And that type of event, another thing that can make your, your plays really easy would be, look, if I'm right about this, and just kind of ballpark in that 165, 170, it doesn't mean I want to short, right? It just means I'm looking to see if the yen's going to deleverage, if the yen's going to all of a sudden be a, a repricing event, then it would be pretty simple. Let's see if we just break the inner trend line go to an outer trend line, come back and retest previous resistance. Because when it comes to these moves, it is actually obedient. Like this swing right here from low to high, it pulled right back to the 50% on a fib swing. So it works, yep. but we have to wait for that to happen. So I'm watching the Japanese in from that regard. And also if you wanna know, you know, my gosh, the market's gonna tank. All you have to do is look at this, okay? If you look at high yield bonds, this is essentially your widening credit spreads. You know, one thing that's always been a precursor to a volatile market and potentially things breaking loose is when this changes. OK, look what happened in February and March of 2020, right during the when we had the expirations from February to March of 2020. Look at what JNK did. Don't. Yep. OK, yep. if right now you see that JNK is going nowhere, these this means that credit spreads are pretty tight. This means that the overall spreads in the market are tight. If these widen, this is where things get worse, okay? So if we start to see this going down, sure, volatility is coming. Market's probably gonna sell off to what degree we'll find out, okay? But if this is steady and this is sideways, the market's just gonna hum along. And, and this is where, you know, you read, it's, it's we expect a bull market, we expect a rip, we expect a blowout top. Pausing or drifting or going a little bit sideways, not having it be super exciting, is actually okay you know i i have a lot of positions that should be profitable very profitable over the next 30 to 45 days take some profit redeploy do it again and again and again and hopefully that's the case if we're, if we're gonna go sideways but i i you know it, it just seems like you got to price in so much of a black swan and so much of your cover your butts and i mean and it's okay you should you should you should have something where at least you know if if we have a 10 to 20 percent drawdown on the markets you're not on the hook for all of it you're trying to be as, right. as you know as, as diversified or uh, you know, non-correlated as possible. So you're not just going tick for tick with what the market's going to do on a, on a, on a you know, large, large cap basis. Yep. So, but anyway, I'm just watching the NK and I think that the Japanese end was an interesting, uh, you know, piece of news this weekend to kind of give it, give me some, op, you know, give me, give me some perspective on, okay, so it's not a level that the intervene at, right? This isn't the Euro Swiss pegged at 120. The, the dollar yen is not pegged at 160. It's just ready to change. So if it's 9, 10, 11% that it appreciates, that makes a big difference when the bank span might step in. But I am not trying to time a, a Japanese intervention. I'm just saying, don't be surprised if we drift up there that we actually have, 
you know, and seasonality wise, typically the NF is going to strengthen. It's usually a late in the year move. It's it's a November to January, uh, you know, end of the year type move. And if that is the case, we could we could see a nice, you know, couple thousand pip retracement, which would be great for Forex traders. But man, tough, tough, tough to time that BOJ stuff. So trade. Yeah, carefully. no, it, it certainly is. Did you know we do a live trading show Monday through Friday with guests from all over the world? To get notified when we go live, click the bell button next to the subscribe button or check in at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. We have helpful, free content in the description below and on our website, a1trading.com. Thanks for watching today's video and we'll see you tomorrow.